Hello and welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Farouk, not coming from Johannesburg today, but coming to you from Sao Paulo in Brazil. I'm in Brazil attending a conference on um, how to build sustainable democracies, and this conference is being hosted by the Frederick Ebert Foundation. Um, on the uh, sidelines of the event, I caught up with Jan Kreutz. Jan is going to talk to me about the crisis in the Eurozone. Um, Jan Kreutz is a policy advisor for environment, social and employment in the Party of European Socialists. Now Jan, um, as South Africans we've been following the Eurozone crisis fairly closely. Our media has been reporting on it fairly consistently. We're very interested in um, how things are developing in, in your part of the world. We're particularly interested in hearing more about the austerity measures that we're hearing about that are being imposed on, on Greece. Uh, what's the impact on Greece and on, the, uh, on Europe in, in, in general? Um, we'd like to know a little bit about um, Greece's position in the Eurozone. I understand it's very fragile at the moment. Some people are calling for it to be ejected. Um, and we'd also like to hear, seeing as you come from the Socialist Party, what you think of these austerity measures, um, what you think would have been uh, appropriate measures, and what you think could be alternative solutions to the ones that are currently being presented. Yes. I think we're not talking only about the Euro crisis as such. I think we're talking about something much bigger. We're talking about a crisis of the economic model that we have seen over the past decades. And I think what we see here is especially a social and employment crisis. We now have nearly every month the highest unemployment ever in history in Europe. And we have a higher poverty rate than we ever had before. We still have massive economic problems, especially in countries of the South, but also in the new member states that joined the European Union some years ago, which stopped to catch up to the level of well-being that we have in the rest of Europe. So we have a very multidimensional crisis that isn't not only concern the Euro, but concerns a lot the people and the everyday life they have. And when we speak about the Euro crisis as such, we have to rather speak about a refinancing crisis. Because it's not that the Euro as such is in trouble, but countries have a problem to finance their economic activity, to finance their national budgets, which again is partly due to the nationalizing and which of Which are the countries most debts. affected by this? The countries most affected at the moment is of course Greece, which we hear a lot about, but it's also Spain, which is one of the next countries to, to be in the headlines, already is in the headlines. We have massive problems in Portugal, in Italy, we have problems in Hungary, and uh, there might be some more countries in the future. So it's not an issue that concerns Greece alone, but due to some problems, especially in the debt crisis in Greece, Greece is the first country that has been hit very hard. And it's also the first country that has been rated by the international or by the American rating agencies as having less economic value than any of the African countries, for example, like Congo or um, South Sudan, to just make a comparison, have a higher rating than Greece as such, which also shows a bit the, the absurdity of this debate of saying that Greece is not able at all to compete economically. Um, you sp spoke about austerity, and I think we have here a problem that while of course it's true that we have a problem of too high debts in many countries and it's necessary to reduce these debts because we cannot live on the expenses of future generations, we have to think about what's the best way to get there. And the austerity that has been implemented in many European countries, especially in Greece, but also now in Spain, is the wrong way forward. Because we have to think about the question, how do we get economic activity launched again? How do we especially fight unemployment? How do we fight youth unemployment? Greece and Spain have more than 50% of youth unemployment. That's more than every second young person has no job whatsoever. And out of the remaining young people in jobs, less than half have good jobs with an unlimited contract with a decent salary. So we have a huge problem of getting the economy going again. And only if we get the economy moving, if we get unemployed back into, the, into work, we can actually fight deficits. Because if we continue to have lower and lower taxes, because no one is working, if we have higher and higher unemployment benefits going to the people that have no chance to work on the labor market or to be integrated in the labor market, and if we have less economic activity, we'll never be able to balance the budget. So we as a party of European Socialists, other than the conservative majority, which we have in Europe at the moment, we propose to look at a different way. We look at investments. We think, how does the economy go forward again? We have to create new jobs. And we have to do that smartly. We don't have to just throw money at people. 
but we have to enable people to be better skilled, we have to create jobs where in the future jobs are needed, that's especially the green economy, renewable energy, energy efficiency, that's the health sector where many people can be employed and have to be employed in the future, and that's the ICT sector where also a lot of potential for job creation is available. So if we manage to invest in all these areas, if we manage to educate people much better, then we also have a chance to fight the unemployment crisis in Europe and that's the only way that we ever get over the debt crisis we have at the moment. And what you're saying is that the austerity measures are not job creating measures, basically. No, the austerity measures are the opposite and that we see very clearly in Greece by forcing the country, first of all, to sack people in the public sector, of course you have more unemployed. By reducing public investment you have the same effect, that you have more people that leave or have to leave the labour market that are kicked out. We have a similar tendency now that the Conservatives try to weaken labour market protection, so to make it easier for companies to fire people, which of course immediately results in people being fired, because that's the whole point of the measures. So we see more and more people leaving the labour market and being basically desperate, being at home not knowing how to move forward. So we have to think much more how we can use active labour market policies, which is one of the very successful models that has been done in the Scandinavic, Scandinavic social model, which is a bit of a role model in Europe. They have used active labour market policies, creating jobs, ensuring that every job, that is every vacancy that is there is filled with a capable and qualified person. They help people to upgrade their skills and they help people to remain active. They try to have very short periods of unemployment instead of just accepting the fact that unemployment exists. So this is one of the crucial measures that needs to be done. And we are not speaking when we say austerity is the wrong way forward. We're not speaking about new debts. We believe that there isn't enough money available in the world. It's a matter of redistribution. And we have to move through new incomes. If we would introduce a financial transaction tax, for example, that's 0.05% of taxes on every financial activity, such as trading of stocks on the market. If we would introduce this 0.05% tax in Europe alone, we would generate 200 billion euros of income annually. And that money could be used very well to create the new jobs, for example, in the green economy. But we can also work a lot with making our tax systems more progressive. And what is the appetite uh, amongst the leadership um current leadership in Europe for this progressive taxation system and for these reforms that you're suggesting? We have an ideological battle here. The Conservatives and the Liberal parties, of course, do not believe in this progressive taxation um, because it's not the neoliberal model that have been, they have been advocating over the past decades. So they often have introduced flat rate taxes, in the, especially in the Eastern European countries, where everyone pays the same rate of taxes independent of the income. Whereas we believe progressive taxes which is the opposite, have to be introduced. So the more you earn, the more taxes you have to pay. And especially you have to move from taxing labor to taxing financial income. Because most people that have a lot of money in Europe don't earn it with their work, with the hard working force they use, but with capital. They're either inherited from their parents or they're made early with, with some financial deals. And we have to tax more the, the, these uh, financial um, the financial capital than we tax labor, which would also make labor for us a bit cheaper and therefore more competitive. And maybe, as I mentioned, competitiveness, which is also a word used a lot in Europe lately. I think one of the major challenges is to look at competitiveness differently. Of course, whether economy is competitive or not decides over the economic success of a country. But the competitiveness does not depend alone on the wage cost. That's a big mistake the conservatives are doing in Europe. They try to reduce wages everywhere and think that this will increase the economic activity, but that doesn't work because the, more, the less money you have in your pocket, the less money you can spend on the internal market. So the demand decreases and economic activity is going lower. So what you should do on the opposite is increase the money available for people. And we believe that instead of reducing wages, what we have to do is make people smarter. We have some calculations that for Europe in the next decades, 20 million people with low skills will lose their jobs, or 20 million low-skilled jobs will dis be destroyed, but 9 million highly skilled jobs will be created. So that means overall we have a problem with job creation, but especially we have a problem that the jobs that we will have in the future are higher skilled jobs. People need to have a better education than they have today. So we need to massively invest in education, in better training systems, 
and that will increase our competitiveness. As you can easily figure, Europe is not able to compete with China on the basis of the lowest wages. We can only compete on the ba basis of the best quality we produce, the smartest workers we have, and also workers which are socially protected and therefore are willing to contribute to the innovativeness of companies. And one last factor, and there I come back a bit to the discussion we had here today in Sao Paulo on sustainability. We have a good experience in Germany in increasing energy in in intensity or energy efficiency of production and also raw material efficiency. So if you manage to produce the same car with half of the metal use than we did in the past and with half of the energy produced than we did in the past, you manage to reduce the cost considerably and make that car much more competitive all over the world. And there are charts that in Germany, for example, the average product, only 25% of it is labor market costs, so the wage cost of the employee, whereas 40% are resource and energy costs. So if we manage to cut down on energy and efficiency, or like increase efficiency and cut down on energy and raw material, then we manage to make our products cheaper. And that is the way we can compete with the rest of the world. Yeah, saving jobs and saving the planet. That sounds very idealistic, but it actually is the reality. We have done that in Germany, we are doing that in Denmark. In Spain there is a lot of movement in that direction. And that's really the way to go, that we just have to think how we produce differently in order, as you say, to save the environment, but at the same time manage to also be more competitive. It's not a contradiction, but it can work. So what do you think in the short to medium terms are the prospects for trying to achieve such goals? Is there space for it? Honestly, I mean, I'm from a party, so you will not be surprised of the answer. First, we as social democrats have to win more elections. We have not been so successful in the past uh, years of winning elections. We have a very important election coming up in And what France. was the reason that you were not uh, very successful in winning elections in past years? Their entire libraries have written about that, and I don't think I can replace those libraries. But uh, trying to speculate, I would say one of the reasons is that people in times of crisis look for stability. They don't like to change governments when a crisis is already ongoing. And also the conservative and liberals were pretty good in communicating that the problem was not really the economic model we have, which we believe is part of the problem, not the only one, but part of the problem. But the conservative and liberals kind of convinced a lot of people in the society that things were done wrong. The system was right, but it was not implemented right which is, for example, the fact why in Greece there are so strict measures trying to show the Greeks, you have been wrong, you have spent too much money, and only if you reduce your expenditure you're going to succeed, instead of looking, can you, for example, increase uh, in, uh, income. So these are two of the reasons. Um, also, we have been swimming a bit on a similar tendency. Neoliberalism was very big in the 90s, and not all of our governments, of course, have been very carefully in using it. We have implemented some of the measures that are, have not been very successful. I mean, we admitted that it was the wrong direction. We tried to correct our policies, especially as a party of European Socialists. We are very outspoken on overcoming austerity measures, moving towards investment for jobs, for social protection and so on. And I see a lot of uh, acceptance on the side of economic advisors, of economic experts, even uh, Joseph Stieglitz. Um, who is a very respected economic expert and he says what the European Union under the Conservative governments is doing is wrong. No other continent is trying to move forward with austerity. Every other continent is moving forward with investments. China is doing so and they have been very successful in doing so. Brazil is doing so, the United States is doing so and I guess South Africa as well. So there is more or less economic or not more or less, there is clear economic backing that what we propose is the right thing. But there's such a big ideological conviction or wrong thinking on the side of conservatives that they're not ready to accept that they have to change direction, that they have to think about a new economic model. And that's also linked to the role of financial markets. Financial markets have become stronger than politics in the past years. And that's very hard to admit because first of all, you have to explain as a politician, why did you allow it? And secondly, you have to explain how can you overcome that? Um, and you also have to admit that you're not the person deciding anymore, even though that is your role as elected politician. So one of the steps we have to take is also bring back regulation in the financial market. We, we don't think the financial market should stop existing, we don't see ourselves as an enemy. But every market needs some kind of rules, some kind of regulation, otherwise markets do not work. And that's even a very old economic theory. So we believe that there should be a number of regulations back on the market in order to make the financial system work. 
to bring the hundreds of trillions of euros and dollars which are flowing for and back every day on the electronic, uh, basically not real uh, financial markets, to bring back at least a part of this money to the real economy would solve a lot of our questions. And we have proposed a lot of regulation linked to the activity of hedge funds, of private equity, um, in relation to the minimum guarantees of bank or the, the minimum capital requirements for banks and all these things. So I think there is still a lot of room for maneuver considering how bad the crisis was, how, how strong these results were for the economy, especially for the ordinary people, for unemployment. We've done very little to overcome the real sources of this crisis. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you for joining us. Um, today coming to you from Sao Paulo.